Good morning, my name is Russell Moore and um, I've been invited by your Daniel to uh, speak about uh, the Daniel in the Bible. Um, and we're going to be looking at chapter one of Daniel. Um, it's good to be with you and I'm going to start as I would normally do if I was in a church building or in a pulpit. And I'm going to pray because um, I need it, all right? Father God, um, as we open your word virtually or together, um, I just pray that you would open our hearts by your spirit. Lord, help us to understand this in your supernatural power and understanding that we might have the mind of Jesus, as you promised. Please speak through your powerful word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I'm used to doing is um, giving a strap line to help us understand uh, what I think is the main thrust of, of this passage, um, of any passage. So this is my strap line. It is God proves his power through the faithfulness of individuals. God proves his power through the faithfulness of individuals. And I've got three headings, um, and they are from verses one to seven. Daniel is removed. Daniel removed to his home. Uh, eight to 14, Daniel resolved. Daniel resolved. And then uh, in verses 15 to 21, Daniel's faith proved. Daniel's faith proved. All right, so let me just ask us, ourselves a question, okay? I don't know if you've ever felt like um, an alien or an outsider, the, you know, the odd one out. Maybe, um, you know, in school, uh, maybe in sports, maybe in work, uh, in any context at all. Sometimes we feel as if we don't belong. We feel like the outsider and we're not being included. Um, as our culture and our values change, do you no longer feel at home in your country, your culture, your town? Um, maybe it, it's the assault by the human sexuality stuff, which just seems to change everything at every level. Um, or maybe it's just the decline in honesty. Uh, you, you can't just shake hands on something. You've got to have you know, four pages of, of fine print with a lawyer. Do you feel pressure to give in to it all so that you can be included, you can fit in? Do you feel God has no power and you just must give in? Or maybe it could be God's will to break his word and fit in with everything else. Well, Daniel was removed from his home, his culture, his heritage, his nation, and placed in an alien nation. Daniel was among the elite in Israel, the ruling parties, the, the great families that ran uh, the politics, the religion, everything. And Israel uh, was seen as the kingdom of God, the promised land. Uh, it's where God's temple was, where God dwelt. Uh, it was kind of meant to be his garden of Eden on earth. But Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm just going to call him Neb from now on, Nebuchadnezzar in verse one of our chapter one of Daniel says, invaded the kingdom of God and removed God's king, verse two. And at this time, verse two tells us that the king was Jehoiakim, king of Judah, that is Israel, God's country. And uh, he removed God's king. He removed Daniel, verse six, and others, and he moved, removed stuff from God's house, the temple, and in a great symbolic gesture, placed it in the temple of Neb's god, Beltis. Daniel was removed from his home, his culture, his civilization to what could be described as an anti-god culture in Babylon. Do you remember the old song? By the rivers of Babylon. Well, that's from the Psalms and it reflects how the people felt at the time when they were removed from their home and their culture to live in an alien land. Well, Dan must have felt overwhelmed by the strange morality, the new gods stuff. Um, he was a slave under the all-powerful Neb, an alien, an outsider. He was the odd one out. 
And he must have had a lot of questions himself. If the Lord, God Almighty, the God of Israel, is sovereign, is powerful, uh, not only in his own land, but outside his land, how come the kingdom of God, Jerusalem, was destroyed by Neb, a pagan? How did he get defeated? Um, you know, where is God in this is what Daniel must have asked. I don't know if you ever asked that. Where is God in all this? Well, Daniel even had his name removed. Daniel, which means God is my judge. God is my measure. God is my yardstick by which I measure stuff. That's what his name meant. Became Belteshazzar. Beltis protects. He was even named after Neb's God. And Dan was tempted, must have been tempted, to surrender to the new values and the new gods. You see, Neb wooed him, tried to win him over, and he was a clever king, King Nebuchadnezzar, a great king. And you can see stuff about him in the British Museum if you go there today. Real history, a real king. And he tried to win Daniel over by giving him, in verse 4, a first class education celebrity status and he was fed with luxury foods and wines from the king's kitchen so dan had gone from being the elite in in god's kingdom israel to being a slave taken off into exile to babylon and then raised up to be offered elitism status all over again different place same status Easy living, did it matter where? Daniel knew Bible wisdom, so he knew how to make the best of things anywhere. Maybe this was just a new thing from God and he should fit in, adapt and thrive. Even if it is a bit different from God's word and God's world. And after all, I mean, God didn't win, so why fight what God has done? Well, actually, Daniel became resolved. In verses 88 8 to 14, Daniel resolves, verse 8, he chooses, decides to stay godly, to apply God's kingdom values to his life and circumstances, not to give in to the new gods of Babylon, to the new culture, no matter what the threats to living or life were. He chose a line he wouldn't cross. I think sometimes we have to choose our own lines to commit as well, where some people would say that that's not a, a huge issue. There's a better outcome. Some people take a strong line. Um, I recently went to live in a country called Malawi for a short time to help out with a church there in a place called Blantyre. And the minister there and his wife wanted to adopt a child from the country and remove it from um, harm. And the process took about a year. Uh, they were allowed to see the child very frequently. They were emotionally involved with the child. Um, and on the day the child was delivered to their house, the person in charge demanded a bribe of a car battery. Just car battery. It's not a lot. Not that expensive even there. But the minister there said, no, I can't give in to um, a bribe. That was his line. He wouldn't cross that line. And they took the child away and they never saw the child again. So we might say that's cruel on our side. But why not have compassion and just bend a little bit? I think I probably would have done. But that minister, that was his line in that country. And many of us have lines that we set for ourselves that we won't cross. There is room for manoeuvre. We have to choose our own lines. But for us, the New Testament gives us ample guidelines for any context. What was Dan's line that he wouldn't cross? It was the luxury food, verse 8, from the king's kitchen. Food from Neb's gods. You see, eating from Neb's table with these luxury foods was a tacit submission to Neb's gods, accepting their power over Dan. Power to provide.
power to provide. Um, you see, the gods would have had the food sacrificed to them from Neb's table so that Neb could prove how powerful his gods were. Uh, and eating Neb's food for Daniel would have denied God's Old Testament food laws by which faithful people in those days lived differently from other people, lived as outsiders from the rest of the culture. Different food proved whose they were. So Daniel resolved not to eat or drink with Neb's gods against God. Now, it wasn't an easy choice. It was a fearful choice, given Neb's superpowers. But God overcame Daniel's fears and, to help Daniel, overcame the supervisor's fears in verses 9 to 10. The supervisor who feared punishment if Dan and his friends didn't eat from Neb's table or started to look worse off. And, and all of this, all of this great encouragement, the supervisor, his own powers and strength of will enabled Dan to keep his resolve to serve God. So this was Bible wisdom to stand out for God in an alien morality, alien kingdom, alien culture, to show Daniel was not defeated by Neb's gods. And this is faith to trust. No particular promise of rescue in the situation, plenty of threats to life and easy living, Daniel resolved and left it to God. How do we do on that test? Do we resolve and, and stand with our faith on the smallest things or even on big things? Or do we surrender to fit in? Do we just capitulate because we're afraid? Or do we even rationalise it that God wouldn't mind if we did this or that? I know I often do. Too often. Well, in verses 15 to 21, we find that Daniel's faith is proved or proves God's power. One man all on his own in a foreign country, Daniel's faith proves God's power. You see, this section here in verses 15 to 21, where they choose to eat vegetables, is not a vegetarian application. It's not an advert to say that this is what we must do. The principle behind it is that these foods couldn't have been sacrificed to Neb's gods. It's the way Dan chose, in faithfulness, to show his undefeated faith in an undefeated God. See, the power of God, the kingdom of God, stretches over country borders and over defeats. God proves his power by allowing Dan to pass past the health test. And again, let me just say, we're not part of the prosperity gospel that says if you eat healthy foods, you will always be healthy if you worship God. This was a particular test in a particular time. Health proved God's power in this situation. Because verse 15, after 10 days of eating just vegetables, Dan was healthier and better nourished than the others who had been eating from the king's table, from the king's God's food. Um, Daniel was better nourished by not submitting to Neb and his gods. And then God further proved his powers by verse 17, giving wisdom and knowledge and insight as a gift to Daniel. God's wisdom and knowledge and insight. God's. Now, the Babylonians were renowned for their wisdom. They built amazing architectural things. They conquered countries. They were remarkable as architects in many ways. And Neb's architectural features are amongst the seven wonders of the world. We don't have them now, but there is great record of the, of the, the hanging gardens of Babylon, which made Neb so proud, as we'll see later on in Daniel. And in verse 19, we find in every matter, Dan's God wisdom was ten times better than the famed Babylonian wisdom. God wins again through Dan's faith. But actually God has proved the most powerful throughout this apparent story of defeat. And Nebuchadnezzar has invaded God's kingdom. The temple has been pulled down. People have been taken away. And they look militarily defeated. Dan knew, as we should, that it was part of God's purposes for his people. 
that God is always in charge. God fulfilled warning words from earlier in Bible history, from Deuteronomy actually, by exiling the people from God's kingdom, a rebellion. Jeremiah predicted exile back in the Old Testament as well, and because um, the people trusted temple religion, if you want to put it, the, the church building rather than the God who the church represents, uh, they didn't trust God. They were putting their trust in their ways they thought of manipulating God instead of just obeying God and trusting him and loving him. So in verse 2, it is God who removes King Jehoiakim from God's kingdom. And God removes them to Shinar, what does it say? And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Shinar is where the Tower of Babel was. So Babylon is literally a word associated with the Tower of Babel, which is a symbol of people's rebellion against God. It's where Adam and Eve were rejected from the Garden of Eden. It is another exile going on with Daniel and the people back to Egypt and return to slavery as Deuteronomy predicted. God's gifts of intellect may be 10 times more powerful than the fabled Babylonians, but the whole situation is in God's hands and it shows God's in charge. His word is true. It will be fulfilled. His power is over all. And we see it through the person of Daniel and his faith. And so finally, in verse 21, Daniel outlives Neb and Neb's eternal kingdom. This is a kind of uh, synopsis before we go on to further bits in the Bible. And Dan lived until Cyrus the Great uh, a, a God-predicted successor to Neb's dynasty, the predicted rescuer and returner of God's people to God's kingdom. And you see that in Isaiah 44 and 45. God uh, Dan lived until that king could allow that edict of return to be fulfilled. So, friends, in some way, Daniel's world is our world and our world. Daniel's world and our world um, are in opposition to God's kingdom, uh, living in the world and of the world and for the world, not for God and all the blessings he gives us in the world, means that we have a struggle with our souls. God struggles to hold on to our souls and the world wants to claim it. We want to live for the luxuries of this world, to fit in with the culture, to not stand out, to not suffer, to be able to plan for the nice things in the future. And I get it. But the two worlds are ultimately in contention for our souls. We must, as Dan did, live in our world. And we have to do that, but not for it. We have to know which line we will not cross. Israel, the kingdom of God, is meant to be a picture of heaven in the Bible and God's true dwelling place. Remember that God lived in the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, we're told that God departed. And where God is, is Dan's true home. Where God is, is our true home. But in this life, through temptations, hardships and challenges, we have to stay the right side of the line to prove our faith in God. The line of faith. And by faith, we also can show God's power in our lives and be surprised by outcomes. It might not necessarily be material comforts, the things of this world. It might actually be sufferings. But um, even recently, I've heard from people who are Christians suffering in different ways, who told how uh, the suffering has proved, tested and strengthened their faith in God because the outcomes have been extraordinary. And that is always a prayer, isn't it? In difficult times, in contending times, in tempting times, to pray that God will bring good outcomes and we will persevere in faith and not give in. Hebrews 11 reminds us that the prophets conquered kingdoms by their perseverance in faith, that is in belief, in trust in God and his power. Will we be faithful? 
Daniel's God is our God, if we are Christians, will we patiently persist and persevere till God decides it's time to reveal his power in the return of Jesus and then take us home to the real kingdom of God? Friends, there are many lessons we can learn through Daniel. Uh, we can learn about the things that he does in his life. But ultimately, Daniel is a picture. Remember, Jesus said the whole of the Bible is about him. Well, where is Jesus in this picture? Well, Dan is a picture, a pointer to another man, a man who left his home in heaven and was exiled to this place on earth to a humble life, like a slave, the Bible says. A man who, by faith, conquered kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of sin. Jesus' faithful obedience, never crossing any line in all of his life, ever, never prevaricating, never rationalizing, never twisting or bending. Jesus' faithful obedience, even to death on a cross, Purchased, bought a home ticket for all who will trust in him. You see, if we submit to his lordship, Jesus is, Jesus hands over the ticket of his faithful obedience, his complete, absolute, and perfect obedience becomes ours so that we can be right with God and return home. Not by our efforts, but by God's conquering efforts. In our lives. There may never be comfort in this world. We may always be challenged. And, and Jesus himself says that, pick up your cross and follow me. There may be challenges like that for us, but by faith in Jesus's obedience, modelled by Daniel's faithful obedience, we can return to the promised land with Jesus. When he returns. And by faith, Daniel, Jesus, and we, in God's strength and God's power, advertise, prove that God is and has promised us a heavenly home. We don't fit in, we stand out, even if it means that the culture opposes us and hates us, as it hated our Lord for doing what is faithfully, obediently. Right. I'm going to pray. Father God, I pray that uh, anything that is of me in this talk would just fall to the ground. And I pray that you would accomplish your powerful purposes by uh, helping us understand by your spirit what we need to know, what the lines are that we need to hold on to and be firm to. Help us to be wise and to understand every context. Wise with the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of Daniel. In Jesus' name, amen.